All right, YouTube, tonight we're going to be taking a look at some Pot Lemon Omaha hands played by my man Andrew Nimi on a recent video blog. We got our wine, we got our Pot Lemon Omaha, and uh, he played a bunch of hands. Looks like he had a pretty good session. I think one of these hands he actually texted with me about after the session was over, and we're going to talk more about that. But, uh, you know, I love when people hop into the PLO streets, try the great game out, and it seems like Andrew's been enjoying it. So we're going to take a look at some of the hands, talk a little bit about the plays that he made, what else he could have done, if he was good, if it was bad. And uh, we're just going to have some fun. If you guys have been following along with my music video prop bed, we're almost at 100,000 views. I'm doing a giveaway on my Twitter. One person will win a giveaway to come on my Poker Live podcast. The link is in the description below. Go retweet that tweet, favorite it, and you can win a chance to come on my podcast when we win the prop bet. Next hand, there uh, could be some decent chance that I completely screwed it up, but uh, what else is what else is new? You know, that happened in No Limit. It's going to happen in PLO, if not more so. So there's a straddle line in this hand at ten dollars. The under the gun play makes it thirty. Once again, believe it or not, we're looking down at pocket aces. Looking back at my notes uh, from this session, this is a little bizarre. Okay, every single hand so far has been pocket aces. I didn't even realize while I was writing this down. Obviously, there's lots of hands in between that were happening and going on, uh, but these are, the, these are the highlights I'm feeding you guys, and so far, nothing but aces. So, in this hand, three bets to 100 with ace, ace, nine, three. Three clubs in my hand, but pocket aces, it is a suit, so uh, looking to put some more money in versus this player in particular. We see two cold callers and the initial razor call, so already $400 in the middle there. All right, so Andrew makes a joke about how he's got aces a lot, and I think he actually had aces about 35 times in this video, and um, you're gonna win a lot of money with aces when you make a lot of pretty good hands, and uh, you can go check the whole video blog out, I'll put that link in below. He's got ace, ace, nine, three with uh, three clubs, not the best aces. Uh, I definitely would like to have it more double suited. Uh, straddles on, it's five, five, ten. I believe the effective stack sizes when they started the hand off here was about $2,000. So he said the under the gun player raises and makes it 30. And Andrew wants to put more money in with the ace, ace, nine, three against this specific player, which leads me to believe that this player was a bit more on the out of line, bad side, who's playing just a, a very poor range construction preflop. So I like three betting with ace, ace, nine, three. I also like calling, keeping some more players in. I think I wouldn't advise people three bet these type of aces as a standard, especially against an under the gun open and especially 200 big blinds deep, because I think what's going to happen for a lot of players out there is they're going to get themselves in some pretty high variant spots where they're just unsure what to do and maybe feel a little bit overcommitted with their hand. And then as the stack sizes get deeper, those decisions that you're going to be making on the turn and the river in an inflated pot preflop are going to matter so, so much, and sure, there are going to be times where you flop a top set, or you flop a nut flush draw, or you flop a nut flush, but I think oftentimes a lot of players are going to be unsure how exactly to play this hand on a lot of different board textures post-flop, whereas if you call this hand pre-flop, you can also keep a lot of other weaker flush draw type hands in. When you do flop a top set, I don't think people are going to necessarily put you on top set because thinking that you would three bet pre-flop with those aces. So I can honestly see that it go either way. I think in the moment, if it was me and I felt like this player was making some very weak decisions post-flop, if I thought he was not stabbing enough on turns or on rivers it, it, when checked back to or when shown weakness against him, then I probably would advocate more. I think I would take the line more of three betting myself, but I think as a standard, I would probably advise most people cold call this hand pre-flop. So he ends up getting uh, two callers, one cold caller, which is gonna happen a lot in live PLO, I've noticed is that, especially in a loose game, you three bet and like three people call it, like what's going on here? What's happening? This is just such a different game than online. So uh, under the gun razor calls and we see a flop and this is gonna be fun. Flop's a favorable one for us with these pocket aces. It comes queen, jack, eight, all clubs. So we flopped the nuts since we have the nine of clubs in our hands. We've locked a straight flush, so best hand in our possession. There's two checks and I decided to make a small C bet. Maybe just try and derive some value from this hand and uh, try and try and squeeze out a little bit of value. It's gonna be tough to get a ton of value, I think, here unless someone has king high flush or flop at the top set. So after betting 125, there's one call behind me. And then back to the initial razor who makes it 425 to go. 300 on top of my bet. Tough to uh, try and discern what hands you might be doing this with, but I think it has to be more likely a strong flush than it would be a set or two pair because there's not too much reason to raise those types of hands. Um, it seems like those types of hands would be more likely and more inclined to take the cheap price being afforded on the flop 
to try and improve, especially a set because there's both flushes and a straight available. So I just go ahead and flat call here. And again, not really sure if that's the best option, but that's what I choose. And one player behind me makes the call. So the pot is building already. All right, so it's actually two cold callers pre-flop. I forgot how crazy these games play, but the flop comes down queen, jack, eight, three clubs, a rather favorable flop for our young Andrew here, who has the nine of clubs and the nut flush. And now this hand just takes a turn for the the, the weird because it's bet to check to Andrew. He decides to bet 125 into 400. And he kind of talks about wanting to get value from the hand. And so I, I don't know if this would be the sizing that I would choose thinking in thinking about that. I've been thinking about this hand for two days, but <laughs> I've been thinking, should I three bet pre flop? Should we cold call? Which one do I like better? I kind of like both options. I would probably do both options depending on how I thought the game was playing. And then we get to the flop and this is a whole nother kind of animal right here. So we start about 2,000 effective. I don't know if, how what's the size of the other players in the hand have. I do think it is relevant. It's hard to really fuck up this hand in terms of uh, when, you have the, the, when you have the nut flush here. I unfortunately think that we are going to only get value from a king high flush here. I think even some 10 high flushes, even though it is a third nut flush, I think players perceive a 10 high flush to be weaker than a queen high flush in a situation like this, even though it's going to be the third best flush. So I think that is kind of something to worry about. We want to get, get value. We don't want to fold out a lot of weaker hands. But does that mean we should bet 125? We're, we're keep, going to keep in a lot of hands that are probably going to call a bigger bet like a set. Maybe we get a call from a two-pair type of hand for this 125, and we give them an extremely good price to, to call with, our, with their hand. I think as a standard, what I like to teach people or tell people is that when you make a hand for value, just bet big because I think that when you try to have a strategy where you're you're really changing your bet size around in a situation like this and you decide to go 125, I just think that you're gonna be missing out on a lot of value trying to sort of guess which spots you should bet smaller and then which spots you should bet bigger. Maybe after you really understand what ranges are and what ranges are gonna continue against you and, and what ranges certain players are gonna continue against you with, then it might be a decent idea to potentially start working in a, a strategy like this. I think if you had the ace high blocker, I don't think that we would go with this size. I think we'd bet pretty big on the flop and then try to bet pretty big on the turn and fold the person off his hand by the turn. And then if he doesn't fold the turn, maybe bet all in on the river, which I'd probably do. But, uh, but yeah, I think this is a standard. I, I wouldn't go with this bet sizing, but it might be okay, especially if we can bet 125 here. We get one caller. The pot's about 665. We have about 1,600 behind. The turn, we say we bet about 450. If we get another caller, the pot's about 1,500. We have about 1,200 behind then. So it does set up a pretty good river shove, potentially. Uh, so maybe the size is actually not that bad, like I said, but in terms of... If it's the best size, I, I don't. I just don't think it is. I think I'd probably just go for for one bet on the flop. I'd go for one bigger bet on the turn, and then I would go for about a half pot all in on the river. But as played, he bets 125, gets one caller, and then something really weird happens, which is which is another gun check raises to 425. And now this is just just not something you normally are going to see happen for the most part, I feel like in, in the games I play online, but I think in live, I see players do this with some weird hands where they might have a king high flush, just trying to check raise and their sort of idea is they want to see where they're at. Maybe this guy might have a king high blocker. Maybe sometimes they even have a set, which I don't think so, but I mean, you never know what, what some of these guys are fucking thinking sometimes. They just do the most weirdest things ever. And uh, the guy behind, and it kind of makes it weird because there's a guy behind him who calls the 125. And now when Andrew just calls the 300, the guy behind is getting an extremely good price to call if he has any sort of set or two pair type of hand. There is a chance he potentially has a worse flush and he decides to just call once again too. But I think most players are going to fold out that that hand. So then we start thinking, all right, what's the what's the best play here? And kind of thinking a lot about it. I almost think maybe clicking it back, which it, it, just min raising him back and it, it may be the best play or putting more money in on the, the flop, I feel like is going to be the best play. I don't know if I if I like just repotting it because I think that if a guy does have a hand for value here, he is not going to fold if we min click. I mean, who I, I don't know who's going to fold the king high flush if they're trying to see where they're at and the guy clicks it back like. I mean, maybe sometimes they will fold, but then you, I guess we start thinking about the alternatives, which is that we decide to call and then we go to the turn and then, all right, we're hoping the board doesn't pair on the turn, which we're not that scared of, but it is something to be worried about. And then the board does come uh, blank on the turn and then 
the guy checks it and then it's to us and then we potentially make a, a poor decision on the turn that's not going to get us a lot of value from her hand or potentially miss out on value because once we do call there we can expect the player behind us to call and therefore we're most likely not going to be bluffing the turn when it gets checked to us so if this scenario, type of scenario happens where the, the player one the under the gun guy he check raises two players call and then on the turn it's a blank turn well if we have the ace high blocker we're probably not just going to be betting that turn we're probably going to be re-raising the flop so i think it, it kind of tells the story when you do decide to bet this turn that you have the nuts or you have the second nuts and that's pretty much it i don't think we're going to be bluffing when we decide to do that and now we could say, all right, well, maybe that's a good scenario. We we just call the flop, and then the guy behind us calls. We see a safe turn, and then we decide to put more money in the pot. But I think what I, I would play this hand is I would be trying to stack under the gun one. I do, would not expect him to continue bluffing me on the turn. And I really want to figure out what the best way I can get all of his money if he's got a king high flush. And to me... The best route either seems making a small re-raise on the flop because what I would say betting if he if betting small on the turn, but with that player behind us, we're just giving him such a good price to draw against us. And I mean, you know, it's not something I'd be super worried about, but at the same time, we, we just want to charge these guys when they have their draw. I mean, that's how we make money in the game. We don't want to, when we give these players a good price, this is they're making good plays then. So if we make a small bet on this turn, the turn comes down, we'd say we bet, you know, I don't know, the pot's gonna be 1,600 or something of that nature. If say we bet 500 or 600, now we're giving our players, uh, the player with a set or two pair behind us, an extremely good price to continue drawing in the hand and, and he's not making any mistakes. We might be making a mistake in that scenario. So those are kind of something to think about. Those are some things to consider, but let's go ahead, see the turn and see what happens here. And uh, three ways to a turn card, which comes a brick mostly. It's a, it's a six of clubs. So now four clubs on board, but obviously we still have the nuts here. And the initial raiser checks it over to me now. So I think it's time to go ahead and go for some value here because it seems like the small blind is very likely to have a set here and is drawing. Pot is pretty sizable. At this point, I have about $1,700 in my stack. So if I bet at the pot, that's almost my entire stack. Just go ahead and shut down the small blinds calling range here. Maybe still be able to try and get some value from the initial razor if he happens to have a king high flush. So that's what I go ahead and do, just pot it. All right, turn comes down, six a club, four clubs are on the board. We have three clubs in our hand. Obviously hard for other people to have a flush when there's this many clubs out there, but at the same time, most likely one of these guys is going to have the flush and then one other guy is going to have a set or two pair type of hand. Gets checked to Andrew, pot 1690, and now we have a decision. How much are we going to bet? And um, <laughs> I don't know, man. This is such a peculiar spot. I don't even know. I've played millions of hands of pot in Omaha. I don't know how often I've really been in a situation like this where you get check raised for a very small size, an unusual situation where there's a player behind you to act. It's just very weird. And in terms of what's really right in this situation, I, I'm not... Not 100% sure what I think I would do here. Kind of go back to what we talked about on the, the previous street. We talked about potentially putting more money in on the flop with a minimum raise. I think that is the decision that I do like the most. I think on the turn, what decisions do we have? What can we possibly do here? I think that we can not check. I think we have to bet here. We do have to charge some of those other hands. And we do want to get value from... Uh, under the gun, if they do have a worse flush, maybe not. I mean, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I would always bet here, but there could be a case, I suppose, of potentially checking. But I don't, I don't really, I don't see that possible. I try to think about all the scenarios in these hands, guys. Anyone that watched PLO videos of mine know I overthink everything. I think about every possible scenario, every possible bet size, and just try to think about what exactly might happen in these situations. So, what could we do here? Can we bet pot? Can we bet something like 800? I mean, we are. We aren't necessarily so pocket queens or, or a type of hand like that. Any set has about 21% equity against us if we do happen to have a flush here. So we aren't necessarily going to give that player the, the right price unless we bet pretty small here. Maybe there's some merit for betting about half pot. That guy's not getting the right price. And then hope that the other guy does the go ahead and decide to continue here. Just not really sure what size I'm in love with. I don't think I necessarily love any size right now. And um, what would I do here? What would I do here? Wow, I don't really know. I think I'd be so fucking confused in the flop that I would just put more money in the flop. But if I got to the turn, I think I'd probably just shove. And I don't even know if it's the right play. 
think that oftentimes none of the gun's going to fold. And then Andrew does say this guy tanks down for about five minutes in this situation. And then I do think when we shove that the other guy's going to fold. But maybe the pot is pretty big. Maybe that's a, a perfectly fine scenario if both of these players fold. But I do think that deep stack pot limit Omaha is about making value when you do make your hands. And when you have a hand like this in a situation where most likely one of the players is drawing dead that you cover for 200 big blinds, my main objective is to get as much money from that player as I can. It's just very unfortunate that the player behind us is still in this hand. I think if I was going to teach somebody on how to play this spot and how to approach it, if it comes up with you, I think that I would say, if you're unsure here, just bet the pot because it's going to be hard to fuck up when you do bet the pot here. If you take it down, I think it's a perfectly fine scenario. But I think that once you're trying to get past a couple levels in terms of just, okay, what do I do here? Bet pot. I think when it comes to that, then you need to start thinking about, okay, why am I going to bet a thousand? What might change here? What happens if I bet 800? What happens if I bet 900? What happens if I check? What happens if I bet 1200? But I think a lot of players aren't quite at that level of pot in Omaha quite yet. And I think the best approach for you to think about taking here is if you end up in a situation like this and you have a hand for value, you bet big, you make the pot size bet, and you go from there. And then you sort of see what happens in situations like this, which, don't, which aren't going to really come up that often. But I think overall, that's probably going to be a pretty good game plan to take. Man, I just don't think I would bet a thousand. Like, and I, I would say now going over it, maybe I'd bet a thousand. We give that guy a bad price. But yeah, I'm going to have to go with you guys here. I'm very curious what you people out there think. I think oftentimes like this, maybe some players, if they're talking about what to do in a situation, might say, this is the best 100%. This is the best 100%. But really, it's I feel like it's kind of hard to really fuck this one up unless you decide to check and potentially give a, river, a free river card. Got to get a little bit creative in these live situations like this where, where uh, hands play a little bit atypical than you would normally see online. So we're going to leave this up to you guys. I want to know what you guys think. I think if it was me, I would probably go ahead and... I don't know what I would do. I'd bet somewhere between a thousand and, and pot, but not in love with any option and don't hate any option, but I sort of like them all. I'm just not 100% positive on what I think is best. Which leaves me about $100 behind. Small blind goes ahead and folds and the initial razor goes deep into the tank. Eventually he decides, after counting my stack down, the entire stack, decides to let it go. He makes the fold and uh, if I knew he had the king high flush, obviously I would have uh, preferred a call since he's drawing dead there, but no complaints about uh, a nice sizable pot. We do shut out the small blind who had some equity in the hand. Happy to take that one down as it was. All right. I initially intended this video to be multiple hands, but I can't stop talking for less than 20 minutes about some of these hands. So you're only gonna get this one hand today and I thought this hand was pretty fun. So let me know what you guys think in the comments below. I'll put out a couple more of the hands from this session up here very soon. And uh, thanks for watching, much love. The wine's about gone right now. We're getting a little drunk, but it is what it is. I love Popman Omaha, love the great game. If you guys haven't watched my music video, please go watch it. Please, we're almost there. I love you, thank you, goodbye.